welcome to episode 63 of my Warhammer Conquest review series. Uh, <clears throat> this week I'll be reviewing issue 63, which is a surprise no one. Uh, sorry about the mess, we're currently moving rooms around to give my daughter's room, so I'm going to be moving this to a different room shortly, but nothing's quite ready yet. Um, <clears throat> Mm. Just a public service reminder, Tourette's, don't worry about it, it's just a thing. <coughs> right, um, <coughs> issue 63 comes with a bunch more pox walkers. You should have a ton of pox walkers by now. Um, <coughs> this is going to be the third pack of pox walkers I think they give you. Uh, it also comes with yet another Death Guard Marine. Uh, it's a bit difficult to price this one because it's out of the Dark Imperium box set, <coughs> yet at the same time... Oh, just take these box take these bases out. Um, yet at the same time, <coughs> if you wanted to get it separately, you couldn't. Uh, the nearest you could do would be to buy two packets of easy-to-build pox walkers and maybe... Uh, <coughs> and, I don't know if you can get single packs. I don't think you can even get single single Chaos Marines. Uh, two packs of easy to build pop stalkers would be at about £20, but you get two extra. So you subtract about £2 from that. You're talking to get uh, these by themselves, it costs about £17, but they're part of the Dark Imperium set, which comes at £95. <clears throat> so that comes with a couple of packs like this. Vehicle, a bunch of other stuff, a book, uh, rulers, dice. Um, <clears throat> even out of that, you're probably talking maybe ten to twelve pound each. Uh, you know, ten to twelve pound for a sprue like this if you divided it down. But it problem with that is it's very difficult to divide it down. If nothing else, it comes with a book that by itself is worth fifty pound. <clears throat> so uh, where exactly do you mark the um, the discounts? Um, that being said. Being as this only costs seven ninety nine, either way you're probably getting value for money. You know, <clears throat> well, either way you're definitely getting value for money, and you're not having to buy a whole big box set. So um, another episode, another issue which is still which is worth the cash <clears throat> uh, comes with obviously all the necessary bases. Big one for the big guy, little one for the little guys. And if you've been following uh, Conquest, as I said, each time we got one of these. It gives you a horde, which is really nice. Uh, I keep saying it, one of the things I do like about the mechanics of the Nurgle army is that you can use it as a horde army or an elite army or a combination of both, <laughs> which really gives you a, a very solid spread of things you can play with. Uh, and obviously there are vehicles as well. It gets vehicles from the straight chaos list and it gets its own vehicles, which means you can also play a um, <clears throat> you can also play an armored list. Um, I think it's really good. I think it gives Death Guard players a lot to play with. <laughs> Obviously, again, I'm uh, twitching as fuck. Sorry, no. Obviously, again, I'm talking from purely from a fun game perspective rather than a competition perspective. I'm not a big fan of competition play. Not that I'm terrible at it. Um, certainly not the best either way. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm above average, only just. Um, but... It is a less fun way of playing. You are very much funneled into very specific ways of playing. Actually, I probably am the worst at that one. I haven't played competition play in years. Um, I'd probably suck at it by now. <clears throat> but, but um, yeah, I'm much more looking at it from a from the perspective of a fun game. And um, from the perspective of fun, the massive differences you get in the Nurgle army should uh, should help you maintain a lot of replayability because you're not being bound or stuck to any one specific um, <coughs> uh, style of play too much. Obviously, the Nurgle the Nurgle troops have an overall style of play very much. Um, <coughs> they're very much sort of slow marching forward guys, uh, but even then they've got a few fast troops, and even then <coughs> it allows you to. Get a lot of variance within within that philosophy, which is which is basically how GW armies work. Uh, each army has a thing that the army is overall good <coughs> good at, or that the army overall does, or has a philosophy that covers the army. You know, uh, Death Guard, for example, are meant to be slow and plodding, uh, but quite tough. 
and within the army you get a lot of uh, <laughs> tactical variants. I just think um, with Death Guard particularly, they've achieved that. Uh, they've achieved what looks like their goal there. Um, <clears throat> you've got some uh, <clears throat> fantastic artwork on the front, <clears throat> looking good as always. <clears throat> let's go. Let's dive in again. <clears throat> uh, as always, we've got a list of what's in the magazine, uh, signed by Ian, our spiritual liege. And page one, we are looking at Death Shroud Terminators, uh, with some fantastic artwork here. Uh, for those of you not uh, not familiar, Death Shroud Terminators are part of the Death Guard's first company, and they're just badasses. They're also, with a few exceptions, the most loyal to Mortarian. Uh, they tend to be the guys that hang around Mortarian and hang around <coughs> the particularly charismatic uh, Death Guard leaders like Typhus, and Typhus for example. Um, it's got a nice description here. Death Shroud Terminators are elite scythe-wielding warriors swollen with Nurgle's repulsive gifts. The Death Shroud have a well-earned reputation for cruelty and menace. Death Shroud Terminators tower over their foes. Rusty Gauntlets swinging vast battle size known as Man Reapers. Uh, <coughs> these cursed weapons slide, slice heads from shoulders and limbs from bodies with every swing. Death Shroud are expert warriors whirling their weapons with incredible speed despite their rotting bulk. They are utterly... Loyal to Mortarian. As I say, there are a few specific um, examples that might not be, but the Death Shroud are. <coughs> um, and rarely speak except to pass on his orders in combat. They are silent, uttering no battle cries, even as they carve enemies apart. So, <coughs> sorry, little pop there. <coughs> Basically, badasses. We've got some nice pre heresy look at their armour there. <coughs> you can see even. Even pre-heresy, their armor is very rust street and basic, but um, the Death Shroud really didn't... Um, the whole... well, the Death Shroud... The Death Guard really weren't fussed. They kept their armor in functional condition rather than precondition. Even before turning to Chaos, Mortarian had established the Death Shroud. They were chosen from warriors who survived battles and claimed the lives... That had claimed the lives of their brothers. Each Death Shroud recruit was recorded as slain in his Legion's record and required to keep his face hidden from that day forth. <laughs> There were always two Death Shroud within 49... Sorry. It is said that there were always two Death Shroud within 49 paces of the Primarch. <laughs> so uh, they also acted as his bodyguard. <clears throat> Ancient Arms. Death Shrouds were armed with power size and alchem munitions. The Man Reapers and Plague Spunk Gaulists they used today are to corrupted versions of these weapons. <clears throat> so... Uh, We've got some cool stuff there. Um, Mortarian's always sort of aligned himself with um, symbols of death. That's been sort of co-opted to Nurgle. Uh, Nurgle really isn't the god of death. Um, but a lot of the sort of the plague of death and the plague stalking the land symbology has sort of been moved by GW into um, into Nurgle's realm. Um, so, you know, he, he's kind of death-ish but he he's not really you know he's not really like death when you consider it you know consider it you know he's death by disease at least um <clears throat> however again if you look into history a lot of the um grim reaper and the scythe stuff came from times when um plague stalked the land so it seems quite appropriate for to him to adopt those um <clears throat> there's three death shot there they're fairly cool. Next, we move on to the Legacy of Secrecy, which is, as you can see from the symbology there, <coughs> about the Dark Angels. Uh, we've um, we've had plenty of these before. Um, the others had time scales on them. These ones just say you know, when it started, because a lot of it is secret. You know, some of it you can cross. You can. You can cross-examine, for example, if we uh, we read about the Imperial Fists uh, last week, and this one, they're including Rin's World and Bad Landing, Dark Angel Strike Force, including a major Raven Wing, including major Raven Wing elements, is sent to aid the Crimson Fist and reclaiming the worlds of the Loki sect from Orc control. Um, but just like all the others, it then goes down in sort of a chronological order to explain uh, important battles that um, that belong to the Dark Angels. 
and again it's double sided before moving on to something else so it's if you wanted to organize all of these in in um in an appropriate order in your folders then that's fairly easy as well uh, as we get towards the end if you guys are organizing i've been just organizing these per issue in case i have to go back to any of them uh for this i'm probably going to be reorganizing them reorganizing them in a way i prefer <laughs> once they all come out and there's no chance of me having to go back to them not sure what i'm going to do after that <clears throat> um but if you guys have been organizing them in different ways please feel for, feel free to let me know in the comments uh, next, we move on to the Eldari, uh, previously known as the Elder. They're one of the oldest races in the 40k universe, or at least one of the oldest current races. There are there are several races that are older than them, but um, well, the Tyranids, for example, would appear to be older than just down to the time it takes to cross the space and galaxies. But they haven't existed in this universe in you know in the Milky Way Imperium universe until recently. The, Necron, the Necrons are, again, older than them, but they've been hibernating for a long time. And there are a few other races out there that might be older than them. Um, for example, the old ones who are now extinct were the first race and stuff like that. But uh, Necrons probably still maintain the honour of being the race that's been around for the longest, um, continuously. <clears throat> uh, as such, their technology is very advanced, even by Imperium standards. Um, it goes here, so the Eldari are an ancient spacefaring race that ruled the galaxy before humanity existed. Um, the Eldari, or Eldari, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, empire was destroyed long ago in an event known as the Fall, and, the own, and only scattered survivors remain. Despite this, their armies fight on for the survival of their species. It goes on uh, to explain what the Eldari are. It, um, like they appear similar to humans, they were utterly alien. Um, basically, they started off as space elves, and if you ever get a chance to look at a copy of White Dwarf number one, they're actually listed as space elves in the back. Uh, when 40k started, they were basically humans, orcs, dwarves, and elves, just space versions. So you had you had the Imperium, Squats, <coughs> the Eldar, and orcs with a K. <clears throat> and they were, you know, they were the basic starting races because what what 40k, what GW at the time really um, had done is just transferred what they were already doing in fantasy and made them into sci-fi. Uh, later, <clears throat> a lot of guys were added later. Uh, a lot of guys added the beginning. Imperial Guard, I think, might have been around since the beginning as uh, as well as Space Marine, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, then other races got added as time went by. The Gene Stealers got added as uh, <clears throat> in pretty much in Space Hulk um, as GW were trying to create an aliens race that was similar to the race um, that was similar to the uh, Geiger aliens but at the same time distinct and not copyright infringement. Um, if you've ever played Space Hulk it is very similar to the aliens movie where everyone gets shot and things blow up. So yeah GW have always been in the business of looking at what's really cool and what people like and trying to allow them to play that on the tabletop. Um, does make it a bit weird that they're now so litigious when other people do stuff similar to them, but them's the breaks when you run a business. <coughs> um, it shows us an Elder ship um, and the many faces of the Eldari. <coughs> These are not to be confused with the Dark Elves, uh, who are the Draki, I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce that, but you've got the Eldari, the Exodites, number three is Redacted, Craft Worlds, Corsairs, Outcasts, Drakari, Harlequins, and Yanari. So the Drakari are effectively the equivalent of the Dark Elves. The Exodites uh, are the guys that saw was coming and left well before the fall happens. So you, there are some Eldar held worlds. Number three, Redacted, we can see that has a Slanesh symbol on it, so uh, we can only assume there are some Slanesh worshipping Eldar. Uh, the course says they're Elder Pirates, but either type of either type of Eldari or Drakari can be Elder Pirates. 
The Harlequins are followers of the Laughing God and the Inari. I'm not entirely sure what the difference between the Inari are. <clears throat> but basically, there's lots of different type. There are continent fractured people, complex and fractured people, even more those, even more so than humanity's greatest alien experts comprehend. That said, there are distinct and recognizable cultures that are spun outwards from the ruins of the Adari Empire. Um, the most far sighted sought refuge before the fall, becoming the Exodites. As the birth of the Dark Prince came even closer, arc like craft was took to the void. Many survived the event that laid the Aldari row. Other, though others roam the stars as corsairs, wanderers, and outcasts, or make their lair in dark Komarag. Komarag? Komarag? Don't know how to pronounce that one. <clears throat> Amongst them are savage slavers known as Drukari, enigmatic harlequins of the Black Library, and the Unari who seek to reclaim the glory of the past. Um, it is worth knowing. Well, it's not worth knowing. One of the main things that is in here is obviously the fact that the fall of the Eldar was because they became so obsessed with new things and new experiences because they were so long lived that they, not single handedly, but um, they were possibly the main, um, the main group of creatures that uh, cre helped. Well, that created Slanesh. Um, there was always pleasure, but the Eldari's empire was huge and powerful, not as big as humanity's is now, <laughs> but certainly uh, uh, comparable in size, and they, they were all way too into things, which is one of the reasons that so the Eldar live like they do now, um, with changing caste systems so they don't ever lose themselves down one path. <clears throat> Next, we're going on to Ravenguard successor chapters. It's another, uh, it's another brief... Uh, description of all the space marine chapters and again this is this is two-sided so you can just you can just have a big list of chapters uh, it gives you a basic blurb on each chapter and shows you what the color schemes are um, so you can you can pick a chapter that you like the color scheme of and that you think you can do a color uh, the color scheme of it's worth noting that um, there are some places that um, you can get different transfers from. Failing that, you can get transfer or tattoo printing paper, which you can print. Um, if you're going to do either of those things, buy transfers or get paper or uh, print your own, um, you do need to get something called um, oh, what the heck is it called? Yeah, there's a thing that soften. There's stuff that softens transfers. A lot of companies do it, um, and. If you use that, you can like kind of soften them so that when you put them on the shoulder pads that bend in two directions, basically fully three dimensional bend, you don't end up with those weird creases. It's not something that a lot of people for some reason go on about, but it is really necessary if you want the transfers to look good. Um, we, uh, we've got a nice story there based on the Silver Templars. <laughs> we are covering a lot of guys at the moment, aren't we? Um, the Silver Templars are one of these guys? No, they were not. Uh, the Silver Templars, I believe, are an Imperial Fist uh, <coughs> successor chapter. Oh, hang about. Yep, it tells you around. The first Silver Templars were created in the Gene Labs, founders of Mars. They were uh, amongst the first primaries means to be awakened and served for many long years in Rupert Gilliman's Indominus Crusade, eventually earning their own chapter plant in Novaris. So there's a nice deep explanation of the Silver Templars there, which is nice, nice and cool. Elder Veterans... <coughs> Um, the Silver Templars, elders of veterans, honed their skills while fighting alongside such heroes as Kara Sicarus, Danath Lysander, and even their Primarch Robert Gilliman. Also, they're not a they're not an Imperial Fist one. They are an Ultramarine successor. <clears throat> With the Black Templars and the tendency to use so many uh, Templars, <clears throat> so many names as Templar, I assume there were. Uh, Imperial Fist reverend, uh, followers, but I guess anyone can use a Templar name. <clears throat> Novaris was a simple temp Before arriving at their new home, the Silver Templars scoured the Imperial Data Banks for information on Novaris. Records described a vast dual world herself as Richard Reif. Um, it has a nice uh, bits there. Before the coming of the Great Rift, Novaris was relatively isolated and had not been chosen for further development by the Imperium. It's only tied with men for the Aster Milistarum. And then it goes on to Novaris enslaved. Novaris had proved a tempting target for another force, one with far darker designs upon the planet. Heretic Astartes of the Flawless Host had enslaved the planet's population. 
there's actually quite a big chunk of stuff here. You know, several pages on Novaris. <clears throat> Got a fantastic Slaneshi um, looking Slaneshi Marine there. Um, <clears throat> got the Silver Templars fighting there. Um, caught the Floor's host by surprise. Their fleet was small and hopes to have a gun with the Space Marines. They were forced to flee. Um, yeah, so target telemetry is seed. Beginning on orbital bombardment, ready for tra the transport. Oh, there's somebody speaking. Um, yeah, so there's a whole, there's a whole quite long uh, story of who they are and what they were doing. That's really cool. So I look forward to that. Um, I wonder if that's linked to later in the book. No, doesn't seem to be. Um, we've got the instructions on how to build the Death Guard um, reinforcements. Uh, there's uh, the ultimate way you can build the Death Guard Marine, and there's again not uh, there's again the ways you can build the Pox Walkers, which is fairly cool. If you're wondering why these guys have weird little horns. A, it's because they like horns, but B, it's because there's a lot of uh, weird things out there. But if you look up particularly, and I'm assuming this affected uh, the guys that build this, there's actually a type of fungus that takes over insects. And bits of like almost horn-like stuff grow up from the insects, and the insects keep moving around and trying to find other insects. It'll take over ants, and it'll force them to go back to the ant colony, um, where a lot of other ants will kill it, but the fungus will then infect them in a very similar way to the way that Nurgle infects these. It's really quite gruesome. Uh, cool in a gruesome way, but primarily gruesome, which I always assume is why you've got similar things on these guys. Bow means look up spider zombie fungus. It affects giant spot, you know, massive great tarantulas crawling around. It's fucking freaky. A friend of mine's a biochemist, and he says funguses are scary, and we should all be scared of them. Um, <clears throat> here we've got the Destroyer Plague. Um, Typhus Elaine Lowe since arrival on Corvon 2, directing matters from the shadows, um, and spreading the Destroyer Plague as he goes. Now, the fruits of the labour are coming apparent. A tide of pox walkers has emerged from Corvon 2's polluted oceans and descended upon the city of Huxfall. <clears throat> so... We've got the beginning story for our city, uh, for our uh, event. Ah, oh, what the fuck am I talking about? Sorry, I'm twitching and trying to talk. My apologies, it's been a busy day. Uh, for our mission, that's the one I want to say. <laughs> anyway, ooh, crikey, head rush. Um, a mission the mission includes an extra piece of uh, printed terrain, which is there. As I've been saying, these printed terrains are fairly awesome and I totally recommend uh, laminating them because frankly, they're just they're just really useful. Um, if you're using the mat or if you're using your own stuff, having bits like that that you can lay out and look cool is just gonna add to your games. Um, let's have a look at the battlefield. The mission uses an additional printed terrain placed on the battle mat area shown above. Again, we're using all three battle mats for this, so you've got quite a large space to work in. The armies consist of Typhus, 30 pox walkers, or three units of 10 pox walkers, 10 cow sculptors, and five plague marines. So, again, a reasonable balance of heavy and uh, of elites and um, and hordes. <sighs> Leaning slightly on all the hordes, but you, that does mean you have 46 um, models on the table, which is quite a large power. It's always worth considering um, <sighs> in points battles how many troops you're gonna take. With horde armies, you can get in the way of your own fun if you just take too much. It just takes too long to move. It can be uh, tactically advantageous, you know, to have that many guys, but sometimes it just means that your turns take too long and you, know, you don't get to finish the game and so on and so forth. So that's, if you are a player of a horde army, that's worth considering. Opposite end of the spectrum, off center spectrum, if you're a player of an elite army, it is entirely possible to take too few bodies and then find that you guys are just getting killed and taken off the board too quickly. Um, because, yeah, they do a hell of a lot, but they don't have that many wounds or or whatever reason. I mean, a lot of the time, particularly with elites, you'll find that they're great in multiple roles. Um, but nine times out of ten, 
you'll only use them for one thing primarily during uh, during a battle and being tactical is great but that does mean that sometimes you're paying to have skills you never use so what you can find is your you know the the elite models you know what takes up the points is the skills not the wounds so if they are only doing one thing in a battle and they're just getting killed you know they're just getting killed like normal marines it's sometimes worth balancing that out and not investing so much on individual units <clears throat> a little bit of tactical advice there um, the Space Marines have a Primaris Chaplain, a Primaris Ancient, which is cool. Two squads of five Intercessors, five Reavers and three Aggressors. So that's 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. <clears throat> so that's 20 troops versus 46. But uh, the 20 troops do have a lot of wounds and are capable of doing a lot of damage. So it's reasonably balanced. The deployment. Space Moon uh, player deploys units first. Death card players units move on the board at the start of their movement phase. Death card takes the first turn. Uh, the Space Moon player is victorious if they manage to stop any of the Pox walkers reaching the water pipe marked in red. Which is this thing here and you can see it marked in red there. Death card player wins the game if they manage to get any Pox walkers. Sorry, pick up my nose there. Into base. So any of their Pox walkers into base contact with the center of the water pipe marks in red, this game lasts five rounds, so it's another take and hold. Uh, they've been doing a lot of these, um, they're a lot of fun. And they're uh, they're pretty cool. Um, it's worth noting that the Death Guard players are slow, so they've got to slog across the battlefield. And if they want to gain any more speed, the only real option they've got is to run which means they're not shooting. So either you take multiple turns and risk getting shot more times, or you run and don't get a chance to wheel down your enemy and risk getting shot more times. So it's not too badly balanced, but uh, it should prove a challenge. Onto the page I know a lot of you love. Oh, wow, that's fucking cool. Okay. <sighs> Sorry. First, um, on the six, uh, issue 64, which is next week, you're getting Astro Granite. <sighs> I have yet to really use the first part of Astro Granite they gave me. It's not really um, something I use a lot for basing. I'm probably going to chuck that on eBay, I don't know. Um, but you're getting more Astro Granite. Uh, they, um, they're going to be explaining to us about the Sol system and about highlighting our models. So that's pretty good, and I'm sure they'll have some more interesting stuff in there as well. <sighs> Look at that. Fucking sweet. I hope to fuck those guys are taller, but you're going to get an Ultramarines Command Squad. Um, <clears throat> two Space Marine Heroes. I believe that's a standard Marine. If it is a standard Marine, I will be giving it away. Uh, that guy is probably a standard Marine as well, but... Frankly, that's too cool. I'm keeping it. No, 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 no. But there's a good chance I'll be giving that guy away because unless he turns out to be really tall, he's in Maximus armor, so he's got to be a standard Marine. Uh, just in case you're wondering, that is a pre-heresy Terminator armor. I'm not sure which type it is. I've always failed to remember the Terminator armors. I've got to learn them better. And that one is um, in Maximus armor, which is one of the pre-heresy armors. Um, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Maximus armor was one of the armors they were using pretty much at the time of the heresy. Uh, <laughs> it was one of the precursors to the uh, current Space Marine armor. Um, there was another armor after that one that um, was made during the heresy, uh, which has a load of studs on it. And the reason they put the studs on it and they attached a lot of studs to other armor was to bulk out the armor and make it more bulletproof against heavier weaponry like the marines themselves use because it's the first time they've gone up against marines uh there's no actual reduction of armor stats in the uh in 40k they're all basically just power armor and they all have the same stats but in the in the background that armor was tough and cool but it wasn't as tough and cool as uh, as the modern armor and the reason that a lot of armor got studs on it was to make it was to allow them to fight space marines because they've never had to fight anybody with weapons as good as theirs before. Uh, they had to fight guys with weapons that were different or were weapons that went straight through their armor. 
but they hadn't had to actually fight anybody with weapons that are just as as, as damaging as theirs. Um, it was a new thing. Uh, I'm actually going to look up what sort of Terminator armor this is. So I'm going to pause the video for a while because I want to see what it is. And I have returned. Um, <clears throat> that appears to be cataphracty armor, which is one of the types used by <clears throat> the Ultramarines. Uh, there is uh, Justarian armor, which looks really quite similar, but that appears to be cataphracty armor, which again is a pre-heresy type, not to be confused with a tactical dreadnought armor currently worn by Terminators, which I heard was originally designed to allow normal humans to interact uh, close to warp cores. That's why it's so tough. And then they basically robbed it and said, oh yeah, this will actually work great for Terminator armor. That's a legend that I heard. Don't know if that's true. So that's just some awesome stuff right there. <clears throat> but yeah, um, <clears throat> competition time. Um, if you want this, make a comment uh, beneath in the things and next week I will randomly roll and we'll see who gets this. Um, Oh, to the guy that won the last set of these, they still haven't been sent off because with my new job and with working monthly, I've just been on too tight a budget to be able to actually go out to the post office and post things. But I have money now, so they'll be getting sent off this week. Um, but yeah, for this set, um, <clears throat> pop your name down below on the comments and whoever, whoever gets randomly selected will win a bunch of these guys. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope it was cool for you and maybe I told you something you didn't know and I will see you in a week's time. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video and if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure why, but I am. Um, so, if you like it, see me there and uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.